That was too kind, I'm not used to. My dear friends, welcome to the House of the Americas. Dear former President Laura Chinchilla, President-elected Bernardo Álvarez, Ambassador Tom Shannon, dear Roberta, Rebecca, <coughs> Pablo, President of the Inter-American Dialogue and Distinguished Personalities to be honored tonight with the Leadership of the America Awards. It is a pleasure to be here today at the House of the Americas attending the annual gala of the Inter-American Dialogue. The OES work tirelessly to protect democracy and human rights in the region. Those are two of our main concerns, and we are committed to them. Fortunately, we have a legal instrument, which is, which is the Inter-American Democratic Charter, a real constitution for the Americas. And thank you, because we have very good partners, like the Inter-American Dialogue. In 1980, in this room, one of the greatest champions of democracy and human rights in the Americas, President Jimmy Carter, said to the 10th General Assembly of the OES, the cause of human rights will be all the stronger if it remains at the service of humanity rather than at the service of ideological or partisan ends, and if it is condemns both terrorism and repression. In the phrase, human rights, the rights are important. The human is very important. And we have challenges today. We have a special situations. One of them that demanded our actions, our work was in Guatemala. Due to the challenges that arose during and after the electoral process, which resulted in Bernardo Arevalo as the winner and the president-elect. We have a maintain a permanent presence in the country, first through the electoral observation mission, and later with the transition mission that we formed. Our mandate is to support democracy and the rule of law in Guatemala. We have condemned the unjust and anti-democratic actions, seeking to delay the electoral process, and then trying to undermine the role played by the secrecy of the vote and threaten, and those that threaten, Guatemala's democratic stability. We are all aware that we need to keep our efforts and we hope that the things will definitely get into the right track and definitely this mediation and work will achieve the very positive end, that is the Guatemalans will have a new president, Bernardo Arevalo, the 14th of January. President-elect Bernardo Arevalo and Vice President-elect Karin Herrera were duly elected, and they have the responsibility of implementing their governance strategy with the objective of continuing to improve the socio-economic life of Guatemalans. Guatemalans. They know our commitment to continue to support democracy in their country as we have done so far. They have big challenges, but that is the thing. I have to introduce Bernardo Arevalo, the president-elect. And the good thing about him is that uh, it's not what he has done, it's what he will do. He's a man of future for the, his country, and he has the opportunity to bring normalization to his country, to bring development, to resolve long-standing social issues that have never been fixed. This man has an incredible responsibility. He has the capacity, he has the charm, he has the formation to deal, deal with this matter. And for sure, for sure, to walk the way for a better Guatemala in the future. We need this hope Bernardo Arevalo is bringing this hope, the hope of rule of law, the hope of fighting corruption, the hope of bringing strength to the institutions, the hope that Guatemalans will unite, the hope that will, discrimination will end, the hope that will resolve the life of the majority of the country so underrepresented and undervalued that, like the indigenous original communities in the country. 
It is a big task. It's an enormous task. We have more than faith and belief. We have the conviction that he has the tools, personal tools to do that. And we really highly appreciate that he's here with us today. And that we highly value that we have been able to work with him all these weeks, months. And we, we have an opportunity to hope for the best for Guatemala. It is not always like that, but we have it now. So, dear President. Good evening. Thank you very much. First, a word to my dear friend, Luis Almagro. Uh, you know, now the burden is even bigger than I felt before you spoke. Uh, yeah, I understand. Uh, dear Rebecca, Bill Chavez, uh, Ambassador Tom Shannon, uh, President Laura Chinchilla, and my friend Luis Almagro, and the uh, authorities from the US government, uh, Your Excellencies, friends, all of you, uh, thank you very much. It is a pleasure to be here with you tonight, and I'm honored to have been invited to join the celebration of the eighth annual leadership for the Americas Awards. I would first like to extend my congratulations to tonight honorees, Jamila Ribeiro of Brazil's Plural Feminism Institute and Mayor Jaime Pumarejo of Barranquilla, Colombia. Your invaluable work serves as inspiration for all of us who are committed to the principle and the promise of social inclusion and to the goals of equitable and sustainable development. And tonight's themes, social inclusion and sustainable development, were central pillars of the presidential campaign that resulted in my and my running mate's election in Guatemala this past August. Once we take office in January 14th, these themes will continue to be central pillars of our government plan for Guatemala over the next four years. Our plan of government is based on the belief that despite Guatemala's many and long-standing challenges, a better future is within our reach. I know this belief is shared by most Guatemalans despite years of frustration over the abuse of power and neglect of duty in government. It is a belief that was resoundingly expressed in the more than 20 vote margin by which I and my running mate, Karin Herrera, were elected. This reflects renewed hope, which every country needs, and especially countries like Guatemala, where hope has been stifled by so many successive corrupt governments. Unfortunately, the presidential transition period we are currently in is not a normal one. Our commitment to eliminating corruption has provoked a backlash, one that began almost immediately after the election in August. Guatemala's current government has taken unwarranted and in most cases unconstitutional steps to suspend our political party, to weaken Guatemalan supreme electoral authority, which has been fighting for democracy and to cast doubt to the on the result of the election itself. This judicial persecution is based on fear among corrupt actors and networks that our efforts to fight corruption will be successful. The political persecution is also an extension of efforts over nearly a decade, over a decade, to corrupt key state institutions and government agencies, including those responsible for the administration of justice. These efforts intensified during the current administration and they have left Guatemala 
without an effective separation of powers. The public ministry, which is in charge of criminal prosecution and is headed by the Attorney General, is subject to presidential authority, as is much of the judiciary and most of the current Congress. This is bad news. But there are also positive signs, like in the course of this difficult transition, we have seen some truly historic developments. This time, it has been Guatemala's indigenous peoples who have mobilized their own communities and led a national movement to defend democracy. They brought the country to a standstill, uh, to a standstill for a few weeks, demanding that the results of the elections be upheld and that the electoral authorities be recognized as the sole institution responsible for all matters related to the elections, including preserving the security of cast, of cast votes and vote tallies. This has been a remarkable response, and I believe it will mark a breaking point in our history. From now on, indigenous peoples and their ancestral authorities will have a voice at any national discussion on our political future. They have shown their strength and their determination to play a role that is commensurate with the 40 to 60% of Guatemala's population that they comprise. Their inclusion in the national discussion will in turn have a major impact on social and economic development in our country. The rightful representation of indigenous peoples will be a significant contribution to building citizenship and participatory democracy. Up to this point, dysfunctional institutions have restricted the exercise of citizenship, and the legal system has served the same purpose. And this time, as in the past, the current government did try to ignore the demands of the indigenous peoples. This is why I led an effort to have them sit at the table with representative of business organizations. This was a virtually unprecedented, unprecedented step in a country that has been divided by ethnicity, discrimination, and inequality. I intend to continue this effort to bring these actors and many other sectors in society together to discuss critical issues and to turn this initial unprecedented dialogue into a series of agreements that will ensure inclusive governance. My campaign succeeded because we promised the Guatemalan people that an Arevalo administration's highest priority would be to end the grip that corrupt and illicit networks have in institutions in our country. Guatemalans understand perfectly that eliminating the systemic corruption that has dominated politics and economics for more than a decade is a prerequisite for implementing the policies and initiatives we need to build a country with a stable democracy, social inclusion, and equitable, sustainable development. One of my first actions will be to restore the independence of institutions that have been so badly corroded by systemic corruption, to re-establish trust in their effectiveness through respect and support for their mission. The whole state apparatus has been weakened from inside due to the growing influence of criminal and corrupt networks. I know it will not be easy to dislodge them, but we must do it. We have a clear mandate and very strong support from hundreds of thousands, from millions of citizens who voted for, uh, for us. They are ready to expand into a cohesive civil society, one that brings together a student's organization workers, indigenous organizations, entrepreneurs, and citizens from different walks of life from all over the country together to build a better nation. I know this will not be an easy undertaking. Samuel Huntington's so-called third wave of democracy was a slow and difficult process as it took time for countries to build institutions and develop democratic practices. Today, there are global forces working against democracy. We have seen setbacks not only in Guatemala, but in other countries around the world, 
as autocratic regimes have gained ground and respect for human rights and civil liberties has been gradually and systematically eroded. We see this happening with the return of repressive practices of the past, but we also see new technologies being used to intentionally generate mistrust and division within society. We need to be alert to the fact that social networking platforms combined with the content creation capacities of artificial intelligence pose an unprecedented threat to democratic governance. To witness democracy being undermined and political stability threatened by both traditional and new means is indeed a very troubling development. I believe it's time to think about a fourth democratic wave. Even if that might take a while, we want to preserve democracies that are still struggling to function effectively and to stay alive. They have their own assets, stronger and cohesive civil societies that have nurtured an active citizenry. And they benefit from human rights systems at the global and regional levels, with treaties, conventions, and other instruments for the protection of civil and political rights. And they need strong, transparent, and honest state institutions, clearly bound by rule of law principles, responsive to the needs and aspirations of the different sectors of society, and capable of fulfilling its duties. Today, the gates have been opened to active participation of non-governmental actors. Closing, closing those gates would require dismantling the current international order and replacement by another legal system. It would also require governments to renounce international human rights treaties and pull out of all the obligations their predecessors pledged to comply with. I do not believe that society in Guatemala and indeed in many other countries would accept such a democratic retreat with the curtailment of civil and political liberties that would entail. This is why I am hopeful and determined to keep my word and my commitment to stand for democratic values. I am under no illusions about the challenges ahead. But I want to share with you the inspiration I drew during my campaign when I saw firsthand thousands of Guatemalans who expressed their hope and their belief that Guatemala has a brighter future ahead. My country has many thousand, thousands of young people who are talented and adept and untouched by the corruption that so many of their elders have witnessed. For every corrupt Guatemalan, there are many, many more who are honest and who care not just about their own wealth, but about the welfare of their families, their communities, and their country. These old and young in every corner of the country have been the bearers of hope that enabled our country to break the grip of corrupt politicians on our political system. I am determined to empower them and work with them to do everything that we can in the next four years to build the social, economic, political, and judicial infrastructure that Guatemala needs to build a better future. I know I can count on the millions of Guatemalans who have placed their trust in me. And I hope that as we fight for justice and democracy in Guatemala, we can count on each and every one of you as well. Thank you very much.